Namaste, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to each one of you. Welcome to a very, very special session as a part of the Feminist Leadership Series from the Kodi International Institute. Today is around feminist well-being. And that's very interesting because the care of ourselves is very political. It's also very personal. It's very social. So we're going to talk and unpack it with somebody who I admire and more and, and love a lot, Hope Chigudu, who welcome. And could you please turn on your camera so we can see you? A heart. Welcome to my sister, Hope. Uh, I want to begin by saying that Hope is one of the most affectionate and incontainable feminist activists. You can't hold her. She just flies, right? And, you know, she's an icon. She's known for her work around feminist movement building and feminist leadership development. She's so accessible and ready and willing to support anyone who comes in her way. I don't want to talk about the multiple places where which she has founded. These are spaces for women, these are spaces of empowerment, these spaces of affection. These are only personal is political spaces, but you know, I do want to mention the Zimbabwe Women's Resource Net Center and the Just Associates, which you know is really spread its wings and is known all over. But you know, apart from that, Hope was raised by the people, the Bakiga of Western Uganda. She also lives for a bit in Zimbabwe. She's been amongst farmers, healers, storytellers, craft makers, dancers, and some of them could also be witches. And they are all very, very brutally honest people. They are people who understand art. They are people who understand communities and flourishing under difficult circumstances. And that's what she inherently brings with her. And when not engaged in work, Hope's love, Hope loves to design her clothes, as I, as you can see, you know, I would love something like that. But I, I, it takes me a lot of, of love, affection, pleasure, honor, and privilege to welcome you here, Hope. And uh, we are, we are, I, I send you a lot of love and hugs from here in India. I, I am Sarika. I am going to be your host today. I've been a part of the Indian Autonomous Feminist Movement for the last two decades. I've worked across seven countries, mostly in South Asia, and primarily work with caste-based sex workers, manual scavengers, and children dying of starvation. I'm also the founder member of the first one-stop crisis center in India. And now we have looked at over 30,000 incidences of violence. So I cannot tell you how much it warms my heart to welcome Hope here. And we begin. It's going to be uh, more or less in 80 minutes now. And with a lot of open questions, which we are going to answer. But, you know, we would want to hear from Hope for the next half an hour or so. And uh, feel free to raise your hand or put a question. And we'll be taking up each question. And, you know, as and when you put it, so don't wait for her to stop. It's a very open one. And, and we send you a lot of healing through this session. That's what it's aimed at. We know what feminism is. We know that, that well-being is fundamentally bound with who we are. And, and if we are women, if we are the excluded people, then, you know, our, our well-being is a lot to do with being free, enhancing our capabilities and being away from oppression, which we inherently face. So let's hear from Hope what feminist well-being is. Welcome, Hope. Thanks, Sarika. I should never, never, never have agreed to let you introduce me. <laughs> and you shall know better. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thanks very much. And I'm very, very privileged to be here. And as uh, um, you have said, Sarika, this is interactive, it's loving, it's for all of us here in this space. So as a way of ensuring that we are really well and we are ready, let's just stretch. 
Oh, stretch wherever you were, stretch. I don't know if you are sitting on a chair. If you were, just, you know, stretch one side the right, which is your left, and let's stretch the other side. Who we'll stretch until you really feel that you are stretching. <sighs> and then let's to our neck, because the neck, it's like a customs officer that is where information from down gets to the head and information from the head goes to the rest of the body. So yes, let's look up and down. And don't continue, to, don't forget to breathe. Up, down. And then turn your head on the right, whatever you call your right. Stretch until you know that you are really stretching. Keep moving your fingers until you know you are stretching. When you are stretched, you know. The other side. Stretch, stretch, stretch. Oh, stretch until you know you are stretching. And now let's roll our heads. Breathing all the time. Clockwise. And clockwise. Whew. And then give yourself wow. a huge hug. In giving yourself a hug, you are giving all of us a hug. Wow. Tight hug. And I send these hugs to you wherever you are. We thank you. Receive the hugs. Where would we be without the missed hugs? <laughs> Very true. So, <laughs> I'm going to talk about well being from a feminist perspective. Why, from a feminist perspective, we grow up in societies that tell us that we are not good enough. Just look at the social media and see how society wants us to recreate ourselves. Mm -hmm. We grew up in societies that tell us that we are subordinates. And Sarika, you talked about freedom. We grew up in societies that bind us, really bind us, you know, uh, whether they bind us with patriarchal ropes, they bind us and cover us with patriarchal blankets. They bind us with patriarchal, you know, almost patriarchal everything really. And because our institutions, our homes, wherever we are, endorse patriarchy, we buy into it. So much so that we even condemn a person who wants to be free. Yes. Even if they are men, you know, if they just want to be to, to get rid of patriarchal blankets, they are condemned. They, they are seen as, you know, uh, less masculine, they are condemned, they are seen as less men, and eventually, you know, they, they kind of give in. We grow up in homes that force us to work and work and work because we are we are women. And the men who grow up in homes that make them sometimes really helpless or make them to have power that they don't have, forced to have power that they don't have. And look at the institutions we go to. We go to institutions that reinforce all that. I don't know about schools where you are, but for me, the schools I went to told me that as a woman, you know, there are do's and don'ts, and I must stick to the do's. And if I cross, you know, the line, then, you know, I'm a bad woman. Yes. So it's very, very clear that there are good women and there are bad women. And once you cross that line and embrace being a bad woman, then even the women, you know, will look at you suspiciously. So our well-being, being well, being free, freedom, uh, being emancipated, uh, liberation, Knowing that you matter, you're a human being, that you matter is compromised. 
-hmm. And this is why we are looking at well-being from a feminist perspective. It can't be otherwise. Yeah, Just there is no way. To give you an example, uh, we were doing field work and we met this man called Moyo, M-O-Y-O -O, in Zimbabwe. We asked him if his wife was home. He said she was. And we asked what the wife was doing. He said nothing. So when we went to the home, the wife was carrying babies on the back. She was pregnant, she was cooking, and doing little things around the home. But when we asked her, you know, what she was doing, she too said she was doing nothing. <laughs> so meaning that anything that is not paid is not considered work. And yes. if you are doing nothing, of course you can't take care of yourself. If you take care of yourself, even the world will wonder why you are taking care of yourself when you've been doing nothing. In other words, you are resting all the time. We work in organizations where working and working is praised. When you meet activists in one room, they share stories of how they work till, till morning, how they had write this proposal until they almost dropped it dead. And these stories are glorified because they are stories that bring in money. They are stories that keep us going. We live in societies where a woman, you know, a woman who is seen going to the gym to take care of herself, a woman who rests, a woman is seen as a, a lazy woman. If even people will say that one is so lazy, she likes herself. In other words, she's not good enough. No. Yeah. And even when we apply for jobs, the question is, are you able to work beyond the, the stipulated hours? And we can say, yes, 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 I can work till midnight so that we get these jobs, but also because we believe in it. And why all this? Because patriarchy teaches, that, teaches us that we are not important. Capitalism teaches us to work and work and work. Religion teaches us to be good women who listen, who obey, obey, not only obey the people you live with, but obey society. And our own cultures enhance this. This is where we are. I don't know if you can relate that moment when you sit and you are resting and the guilt makes you run, wake up, stand up quickly and go and do some work. I don't know if you have a situation where you go to bed early and then you feel so bad that you didn't finish that assignment, although you worked the whole day. I don't know if you're familiar with a situation where, you know, everyone in your family matters except you. I don't know if you know of a situation where you say that tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up early and do X, Y, Z for myself. But when tomorrow morning comes, you don't. But if you have an appointment with someone else, you jump out of bed, you go and you do what needs to be done. Because it's easier to keep appointments with other people than yourself. Than with yourself. Yes. And you know, Sarita, there, Sarika, there are times when you make an appointment with yourself and towards morning, you're even hoping that it's going to rain so that you don't go for that walk. <laughs> and when it rains, you are happy. But if you have an appointment with someone else, whether it rains, whether it doesn't, you will fulfill that appointment. In short, we value other people more than we value ourselves. If all the appointments we make with other people were kept with us, can you imagine how well it would be? If there is someone that you are going to meet, you will be there. If you are going to meet yourself, the self, you won't be there. So it's no wonder that we find ourselves, you know, walking beside ourselves. This is hope, <laughs> she's walking there, but there is another hope walking there because hope lost herself along the way, she's beside herself. So when we say I was beside myself with fear, 
I was beside myself with worry. I was beside myself with concern. That's it. Besides, there is the original hope, the authentic hope. There is another hope walking beside. There is a patriarchal hope <laughs> walking beside the real hope. And we want to see how we can bring hope back to self. Hope back to who she's supposed to be, the authentic hope. Who realizes that, 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 that that's the only hope that she has? There is no other. Who recognizes that she's as important as the people that she keeps appointments with? Who recognizes that without being well, she can't even do this work that she's doing? Who recognizes that being well is a political act? Because you are recognizing your power. You are recognizing who you are, and you are valuing <clears throat> who you are. That is the, the person that we want to get back to. So I don't know how many of us are walking beside ourselves who can say, oh, I was beside myself with fear, with concern, with overwork. I was beside myself. And I don't know how many of you want to return to self as at this moment, or find ways of thinking about how far they are from the self to, you know, to, to, to how far they are far, yeah, how far they are far from the self because of work, because of activism, because of leadership, because of our homes, because of our culture, because of our, because of our religion, because of colonialism, because of everything. How many of us really sit and understand, so who am I? I remember time when I was together. I remember time when I smiled a lot. I remember time when I went to the gym. I remember time when I walked. I remember time when I did my yoga. I remember time when I walked like a free human being. There was freedom. But now I don't know what has happened. How many of us are sitting here that remember those times? My gosh, oh. activists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're stirring some very deep chords in me because I remember, like you said, when I was mm -hmm. sitting and talking with sex workers and we were trying to map out the daily routine, like mm -hmm. how many hours men worked and how many hours women worked. So the women were doing this productive work, which was sex work, right? But they were doing a lot of so-called unproductive work, which was back-breaking, monotonous, round-the-clock. Mm -hmm. And that set me thinking that I was doing something very similar and how we all suffer from time poverty but never acknowledge it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that I have plenty of time even now. I think I, I work on a very budgeted time, like this to this, this to this, this to this. And even taking out an hour for myself during mm. the, the 24 hours is not easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, Sarika. Yeah. And I think there are many others among the people who are here who can remember that time when they mattered, but also who remember a time when they didn't matter. So I wake up very early first thing, check my phone. Even when going to the toilet, stop and check the phone at 2 a.m. I remember mm. time when I have to respond to email because it's so urgent and I must work because that's what makes me a good leader, a good person, a good human being. I remember time when, you know, I was relaxed, life was easy, but maybe that's a long time ago. And now where are we? So I, I want us to look at patriarchy, the impact of patriarchy on the self, the impact of patriarchy on us. And identify one idea or value that we have about the behavior that we must play or expectation we must meet to be considered good people in our family, in our community. What is that thing that you do to be considered a good human being, whether you're a man or a woman or an unconforming person, 
what is that one thing that you must be in your family community to be considered a good person? And you really, you would rather not do it. Mm. A passive object, perhaps. And I have found so much peace in being a bad woman. <laughs> you really look bad. <laughs> you can't be worse than this. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's very true but it's very true what does it take and who wants to be pitied a bad person mm. we all want to be good yeah but, but you know what part, the thing that i do you know that so as to be considered a good woman or good human being is meeting everyone's needs especially in terms of money school fees here you know paying this paying that Honestly, you know, I do it until there is nothing. When people look at me, they say, mm, when people are talking about savings, I keep quiet and pretend that I have some base savings, but I don't have because I've tried to meet everyone's needs. So, uh, dear, you know, sisters, brothers, and others, you know, what are those things that you have done to be considered a good human being? Mm -hmm. And maybe we want to hear some of you type your answers onto that. You know, mm. what have you done to be considered a, a good human being? Or or what yeah. hope is saying? Does does that that stir some chords inside you? Maybe your mm. own experiences that yeah, because we want mm. it to be everyone's experience yeah. sharing. Thanks, Sarika. Whoever wants to share, we can have two, three sharings. I've shared, Sarika has shared. Anyone that wants to share? You could uh, type it in the in the chat box or you could also type it in the... Yes, Maria Maycock says overextending, being the helper. Oh, we're getting mm. some responses saying yes, even when you don't want to, ignoring your boundaries. Then we have Shara, who is from Iraqi Kurdistan, and she says, meeting everyone's needs and change my emotions according to their feelings. Mm -hmm. Then we have mm -hmm. Nikki, who is also saying, always saying yes, and guilt in saying no. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have Riley, who's complimenting strangers is the way I feel part of the com community. Mm -hmm. It's more real than on social media. And then we have Nancy. Yes, what I and many of the feminists I work with find the most exhausting thing is that the work for feminist of justice often does not stop at home. Even mm. the place where people say they love us, they feel it's it, if there is no off time, the personal is political all the time and it is exhausting, challenging and changing attitudes and behaviors even at home when we should be resting yeah but mm. homes are yeah homes are hardly the most sacred spaces can't read your name for me it is a sense of not looking away when injustice is done there at your doorstep in your feed in your experience mm. that not looking away can be engagement reflection and discussion but it does not end my name is Kat. Thank you, Catherine. I just was not able to read the name. Thank you. Yes. Mm. So there's, those are a few reflections people have typed in. And I guess there are more. Uh, recently, two people came to visit. They, they are friends of, you know, some uncle. And then they stayed and stayed. My son came and asked me when they were going. I said, I don't know. <laughs> and he was asking, but how can you say that you don't know? When they, why can't you ask them? But culture taught me not to ask. If they are visitors, they are visitors. You know, from a culture perspective, how do I ask visitors when they are supposed to stay? I thought they were staying for a week. They stayed for six months. Yeah, and I wouldn't ask. I didn't know how to ask. Because mm -hmm. then, you know, what would be said about me? Mm -hmm. So that the, the way you are taught to be a good person, a good human can be at your own expense. 
And if a day was complaining until this same son said to me, stop complaining, I'm tired. Ask them when they are going or ask them to go. But every day, you know, I would think of asking them when they are going, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I couldn't bring myself to ask because I was told, you don't ask these questions. Culture taught me that. Being a good woman taught me that. So I couldn't ask. So the number of times we entertain when we don't want to, the number mm. of times we listen to conversations that really disempower, that make us sick when we don't want to, the number of times that we overwork and overwork, mm. the number of times we never ask for a raise, the number of times that you know we, we, we save away because it's for the good of people we serve are many. We do all this at the expense of our well-being. And how do we, how did we run this idea? How did we run these ideas and values? Where did they come from? Of course, the sources are many. They came from families, they came from the institutions we went to, they came from religious institutions, they came from work, they came from everywhere. And, you know, and we believed. We didn't question, we didn't challenge the ideas because, you know, how? We, we, didn't, we, we thought that everyone lives that way. And those who questioned got in trouble. So the ideas were enforced, they were reinforced and we went on and on and on. We know those who questions were called bad people, especially bad women, bad people. Even those who question their identity or put their identity out there, they were questioned and abused and abused. I mean, I'm, I'm talking from Uganda and many of you might have heard about the, 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 the identity question here where people are saying, oh, you know, kill everyone who is, who identifies as gay. Mm -hmm. And they have gotten these bogus doctors to prove that it's not biological. And, you know, the, the, the religious institutions have demonstrated in support of the president, parliament, which is in trouble, which has been shitting, stealing, is suddenly, you know, awake and trying to condemn the uh, LGBTQ movement and everyone out there is saying, kill them, kill them. So this is where we are. So our own institutions, our hypocrisy, our policies force us to be who we are not. How can you be well when you are being forced to be who you are not? Yes. How can you challenge? How can you question? But having said that, if you could change this, you know, the value or idea of being a good person, good woman, good other non-gender conforming person, what would you put in its place? If you could change, you know, what value idea of being a good person, being a good woman, being a gender non-conforming person, what would you put in its place? If I could change the idea of being a good woman so that I start being outspoken and if people come and overstay, I say, no, 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 it's time to go. <laughs> what would I put in its place? What courageous act would I put in its place? I want you to really consider, genuinely consider who you are, who you are not supposed to be and what that does to you, the authenticity and what does that to you? What does what it does to your well-being because we continue having conversations within ourselves so many conversations oh i should have told them not to come or oh, i should speak up or oh, i should do this and that or oh, i wish i had you know refused to entertain them the first time we have these conversations they disempower us they make us unwell they make us sick they erode the soul of who we are supposed to be we have these conversations in organizations. Oh, you know, I'm overworked. My job description is not over, is not understood. I have to work very hard if I'm going to stay here. I have no voice. 
these conversations go on, we even take them to bed. If yes. one could really open our bedrooms and see what is there, and imagine this poisonous stuff in your bedroom. And so yes. you can remember we are energy. Yeah. And energy travels. We learned that in physics when we were young. So if we are energy and we carry negative energy, how does that affect the next person and the next person? If we are energy and we carry it in spaces, it means it's on our computers, it's on the walls, it's everywhere. So what does that do to our organizations? I often tell organizations that even if you all left and re relocated and left no one, if, you, if the energy within the room was not cleaned, whoever comes in would still experience the negative energy. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. that's true. I, I so, remember a corollary hope, you know, from a song that we used to sing in the Indian feminist movement, which mm -hmm. was like, if, if this is the kind of houses we have to be in, then I would rather be homeless. <laughs> That is yes. scary. <laughs> yeah. You know, if, if you know, houses are not the most sacrosanct spaces, and uh, you know, you're mm. you're pushing us to take a very strong inward gaze, something that we've yeah. all. I mean, I have certainly avoided, and I mm. and I'm also going to take one moment to read through some four or five uh, messages that that our participants have typed, and I think people want to talk. Um, mm. so there is Salive, who's from Zimbabwe. I know her. And uh, mm -hmm. she works with an amazing group called Talia Women's Network. So she says being told we have to show up and being mm -hmm. aware of how we are showing up puts so much pressure on us. What mm -hmm. if I just want time for me? Then there mm -hmm. is Salome who has written, I can relate to hearing conversations that disempower and mostly by virtue of being a woman and what society mm -hmm. thinks is my place. It's a struggle to challenge these perceptions from within my internal defense mechanism. Mm. You see, he's very angry. I see a, a smiley. There is Nogget Matope who's written, this resonates with my experience where I have to give up my personal space for a male relative. Probably mm. in context of what you were talking about, guests. It's quite mm. disheartening at times when I think about it. There is Nancy who says, I believe that. Does that also not apply to the unprocessed, unattended to trauma that we carry from situation to situation? Sometimes mm. I feel with unattended trauma, we cross-contaminate the positive spaces we belong to. Mm. The energy mm. is carried just like left in the rooms we have been, been in. Mm. So yeah, lots of people have it. And let me just quickly check the question and answer. No, nothing here. I think people, oh, there's another message. Let me read it out. So there is Vera and Vera is, is from Ghana. And she works a lot with young girls and women. Amazing activist. She writes, I'm just exhausted trying to be a good person. <laughs> and there is Catherine again who writes, what is the antidote of that poison? that we bring into our heart, homes, mm. and institutes. It is not one moment, one person, but it is a moment like this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks very much, uh, uh, Sarika. The, the truth is that we, we care a lot. And I think the energy thing, you can even understand it when you go into a room and you're uncomfortable. And sometimes someone enters a room very light, very, you know, jerry, and you find yourself smiling. You don't even know them. Yes. And someone comes in and you say, that person is scary. But they have not said anything. It's just the energy. So yes. when we carry that energy into a collective space, what happens? But also that we see the challenges are so huge that one person cannot resolve 
and we need movements. This is where movements come in because as one person, there are some patriarchal um, colonial imperialist, you know, I, I don't religious things that are so heavy that we can't carry them alone and we need mm -hmm. our movements. And that's where movement and well-being come in. Because you can imagine a movement that carries so many heavy people, can it really work? No wonder we fight so much in our movements and some of them never take off. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sarika, I want to go to the rooms. Oh, but we don't have the rooms of Marianne and Jenny. No, 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 not those rooms. The rooms in our hearts. Oh! <laughs> See, okay, <laughs> tired <yeah>. brain. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> okay. And someone has already alluded to that. There are those, you know, traumas that we carry from childhood. We carry them from childhood. We've carried them from childhood for many, many, many years. They were passed on by our mothers who inherited them from our parents who inherited them from their parents and their parents. Parents can teach fear. Mm -hmm. Parents can teach, you know, a good woman kind of thing. Parents can teach patriarchy. So uh, thanks, Marianne. So sometimes we carry too much tra tra you know, trans, trans, what do you call it? Anyway, whatever we, 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 we call it, passing on from the transgenerational fear. Yeah, 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 transgenerational, transgener intergenerational fear. Intergenerational fear, intergeneration trauma. We carry it on from one generation to the other. And when yeah. we are carrying it on, we are not aware. So we pack it in room A. So these are the rooms. We pack it in room A and we throw away our keys. Sometimes we carry violence. We grew up in violent situation. We inherited it. We are violent ourselves. And we are violent ourselves, or we come from violent, not only violent homes, but even violent partnerships. Yes. And the situation is so violent. You know, when you look back, even if you walk away, but you never dealt with it, we pack that in one room and we throw away the key. If anyone asks about healing, we get angry with them and we never talk to them again. There was a person that was really, really close to me. Her spouse died and I knew it was HIV. I asked, you know, I tried to engage in a conversation to make sure that she tested. That was the end of the friendship. Of course, when I look back, I think, okay, it was fear and maybe I should have gotten a cancer or whatever. I look back and I'm not sure if my approach was right, but I lost. And she's not the only person I've lost. Because I tried to open a room they had locked mm. and tried to find the key. And when I tried, they were angry because they didn't want the key and they threw me out. So we have got that room of emotional violence that we put out there don't open and hope that it will be okay. It could also be physical that we are not comfortable with who, with our, with who we are meant to be, whether who we are meant to be has been prescribed by society or by us. And because of that, we also love that one. Professionalism. We look at our career and we think I'm a failure. I've not made it. Here I am. And my, you know, age mates are in the UN. They are holding important jobs in the government. They are all over. And here I am stuck here, 
still working for an NGO as a junior person, that's another room we rock it. It could be a room of food where we try so hard to eat well, but somehow it never happens. That's yeah. my room. Uh, <laughs> somehow it never happens. I hear you. <laughs> we find ourselves eating badly. It could be a room of taking care, really exercising and meditating and doing all the things we know we should do, but we never do. And we keep promising, promising. In the end, we lock it and we say we'll never go there. And we never visit that room. And these rooms have got cobwebs. They are uncared for. They are, you know, the, the house is falling apart. And sometimes even the house, the whole house, we surrender it. We surrender, we surrender it to patriarchal forces. And we never want, you know, to be in that house, even though it is our house, the body, the house is the body. The rooms are different aspects of our lives. So when I talk about rooms, it's an, an, a, a metaphor for who we are and what we lock away so that we are never reminded. It could be a room of secrets. You know, secrets can kill so many secrets and we have hidden them away. And we are, you know, we are hoping that somehow no one will discover and we live in fear. So if I know something and I'm found talking to Sarika, you never talk to me again because you think I've told Sarika all your secrets. And an enmity starts from there. So I want us to take a moment and think about the rooms that we have in our houses, our bodies, that we have locked away, that we don't want open. Some of the keys, we've even thrown them away and whoever tries to tell us to open, we dislike them, we get out of, we fall out of love with them. We talk about them, we gossip about them just because they were trying to make us open these rooms. There might also be rooms that no one knows really except you, but somehow you kept quiet about them and you hope that somehow, you know, miraculously, the rooms will resolve themselves. I want us to know that whatever is in our bodies, whatever we put away, eventually will surface and will affect our well being. So, in, a, in some Christian religious, we are told that when you get married, never tell anyone what is happening in that marriage. I don't know about other religions, but I don't know about Hindu, I don't know about Islam, I don't know about Buddhism, but I know that Christianity teaches us to be silent about things in the home, even Same in our here. family. So, uh, Sarika, I would like us to take a moment, maybe five minutes, draw our houses, look at the different rooms and see which rooms we have locked. Don't fear, we are not going to force you to open that room if you don't want to. It's your room, but you will know. This is the beginning of a process for you to find your voice, whether you say you know, things loudly, whether you don't, whether you share, whether you don't, but you know this room is locked. Today, when I go back, I'm going to open it. I might need support, counseling, or other sisters or friends, but I'm going to open this room. So let's take five minutes. It's now 15.49. Um, it will take five minutes and see what happens. Yes. And then at the stage will take just a you know like a five minutes break. Yes, yes, please. Yes. Don't go away. Draw your house and come back. Yeah. We're not going yeah. to question you around it, but but we need the inner gaze. Yeah. And yeah. when we come back, we'll go through the messages again. Welcome back. So let me go through the messages first before hope begins. So, oh, there is Marianne's message. I love you too. Your smiles, your laugh, your strength, your compassion. That's a great way to start a Monday. Marianne, we also want to see you and your smile. <laughs> and I don't you. see you here. <laughs> okay, <That's nice>. Donata. <laughs> 
Jonatha, thank you. She's just clapped. Nikki Wahid was probably trying to help you by saying generational. So I'm probably reading these messages late. Vivian, thank you. I wanted to mention you because I knew you would have something to say around Uganda. Vivian is from Uganda. So the values and norms in our different institutions that we are watched in are the are to blame here. Gosh, I have suffered emotionally in the name of wanting to be good. Shara, as women, our inner circle is affected, our inner children is affected by patriarchy. So we have to work hard to heal. Salive, I have been challenged on so many levels. What am I passing on to my daughter? What does she see as she observes me in the way I live my life? What am I passing on to the next generation? Salome, I agree with Shara. We have to be in intentional to heal and move forward with confidence. Nikki, oh, I'll come back to her later. So there is uh, Malin who is very happy. There is Nikki who says thanks. There is Salome who also thanks you. There is Aniki who talks about I think silence is more than uh, is more a cultural thing rather than religious. I am a Christian raised in a Christian family from birth. It was never taught to be silent in our faith. Uh, there is Caroline who talks about love the trumpet Sarika. Oh, I'll blow it again. Uh, Okay, thank you, Nancy. And there is one anonymous person who wanted me to read. So my mom was a very giving woman who often extended herself in ways that saw her taken advantage of. I admire her selflessness, but I also see how this affected her later in life when there was no reciprocity. I'm very much like her, but also very careful about who I now give my energy to. But it's a daily struggle to not respond to everyone's needs. I cannot be everything to everybody every time is what I have to remind myself of at least once a week. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing these. Thanks very much, Sirika. So these are personal rooms. And thanks for sharing. If we went the organizational rooms, I'm sure the responses would be even more. How many times have we sat in that organization and we are really, really, you know, not necessarily happy, but somehow, you know, we stay because we think that is our fate and we are scared of speaking out. How many times have we met in bathrooms during meetings and talked about what's not working, things we wouldn't dare say in meetings. When I was young, I joined uh, an organization's board. The, the, the organization was in San Francisco. And I used to meet with a, a, a friend from Nepal. We were like 30 and she would say to me, but oh, back home we are very empowered. What happens when we get here? <laughs> We were really disappointed and wouldn't talk. The women we found were very, very powerful. And would just our only space during meetings was in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So the organization itself has organizations, organizations are meant to power people. We talk about empowerment of other people, but not our own empowerment. Actually, a few organizations start with stuff. We don't start with us. We don't start with who we are. We always talk about the other woman, oh, supporting women to do this, supporting women. To... It's never supporting me as a woman to first get strong, empowered, liberated, so that I can support other women. In other words, supporting the inner so that it can support the outer. We rarely do that. And the way we fight in these organizations, and then when we go out, we are talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, we are talking about empowerment, we are talking about this and that, but what is really happening inside? So we fear to enter some rooms for a variety of reasons, including fear of triggering past hurts and traumas. 
So we wrote rooms because we fear triggering past hurts and traumas. I was very young when I started staying with an uncle because my father was working in a place where there was no, you know, the schools were not available. They were not nice. They were not there. So she, he sent us to work with an uncle. And really the wife was not happy. And because she was not, not happy, she mistreated us so bad. Mm. And I've lived that trauma. It took me time to go back to the denial of food, to go back to the fear, you know, discomfort I felt, you know, every time I was going to, 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 to my home. You know, I feared, I feared, I feared. It was really traumatizing. And then I look at the past and I say, my God, I was really traumatized and I never confronted it. My uncle's wife hated us. I was with my brother. She really hated us. Uh, one time we found that a rat had fallen in drinking water. We kept quiet because we knew if we talked about it, she would be punished. So we removed the rat quietly and threw it away and left them to drink their water. Mm -hmm. I mean, that kind of trauma, you know, can be huge when one is growing up, but I don't know that room until recently. So sometimes we don't want to confront power dynamics, especially with our own power and how we use it or misuse it. So because we don't want to, co to confront power dynamics, we lock rooms, just lock it, and, and say, ah, it's okay. You know, I'll be fine. And sometimes we fear, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry. That's perfectly fine. Take your time, there's no hurry. <laughs> sometimes we fear unraveling what is not working or we feel offending each other. This is very common in organizations where we really fear offending each other and we don't speak out. You can see this person is not carrying her weight. She's not doing the work she's supposed to do. The values are not even remembered, but because we fear speaking out, we fear offending one another, we keep quiet. And then we have these internal dialogues, internal you know, conversations. We talk within ourselves, we go to bed, we wake up, we are thinking, we carry poisonous thoughts to our bedrooms. It's very common. And sometimes we, there are these undiscussable things within organizations, no matter what, they are never discussed. And if someone comes and wants to discuss it, we say, mm, Maybe for us, we have tried. We'll see how far you go. So these things remain undiscussable. And yeah. I don't know if there is an organization that doesn't have undiscussables. And Sirik, I don't know if you know any. No, no, not at all. Very deep structures in most of the spaces that I know of. Mm. And how badly they impact us because they are all very really informal. Mm, mm, mm. They are there, they are undiscussable. Uh, in Africa, I would say the direct is using the organization, the organization of her as if this has. We we'll talk about allocation of resources, we we'll talk about unfair job descriptions, we we'll talk about you know, people who are promoted when we think they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. The organizations that have been part of in Africa talk about those things. I don't know about Asia. I don't know about North America. I don't know about UK, wherever you are. I don't know what you see as undiscussables in the organization, but I suspect they are more or less the same as what we face in the African context. Yes, yes, very true. I could close my eyes and imagine my workspaces everywhere that I have worked is very similar mm. to what you are saying. But mm. you know, I'm just going to go back to the four messages that we already have now. Mm. So there is, there is Tulisil who writes about thanks for this. My dad was patriarchal, but thanks to him, he always empowered me to be a cut above the rest. There is Deborah who writes about we must speak our truth and live our truth. 
and not be entrapped by societal expectations which burden our minds, souls mm. and body and further harm our well-being and ability to function. Mm. There, is, there is Caroline who writes about a response to the anonymous person. She's like, my mother was also a very generous person and was also in acted by the lack of reciprocity because my father was abusive she came to believe she didn't deserve appreciation and respect we have to be mindful of being appreciative and remembering that generous people also need love consideration and support there is siabata who writes about hello see everyone siabata mako here uh okay uh it's just welcoming people and happy to see all of us there is Noget who write in response to caroling. Yes, we have to give and get our bouquets of flowers whilst we are alive and not for people to wait for our funerals. I think it refers to the poem. I received flowers today. Appreciation should be rendered every time. Noget from Harare. So these are mm. some of the things that people are thinking and writing. Thank you very much. So I don't know if we should take five minutes break. I'm going to begin with the messages again. I hope mm. you are fresh and I hope you are at peace or maybe a little stirred. I'm still at peace, which I am. So I want to begin with Nikki's comment. She asks, but mm. then what is our responsibility to the women around us? How do we show each other compassion and support day to day in our environments? Stepping out of these rooms and being vulnerable enough to also receive and trust. Thank you, Nikki, for raising that. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Lynette, who writes, everyone will have their baggage and new ones get added upon every year. The more you open them, the more get added too. Healing mm -hmm. oneself is a lifelong process, isn't it? Yes. Diko Duko writes, True breaks are a form of well-being. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, for for Je Jenny has sort of assured us that mm -hmm. that you know we our our breaks will be cut and our conversation especially. Mm -hmm. Okay, Vivian writes like Hope and I can speak the same language. How nice! <laughs> yes, Vivian, Hope and I also speak the same language. Mm. Oh, and Vera has now written, you are simply beautiful. Now I'm Thank asking you. myself, Thank what's you. my, she asked a very deep question. What's my responsibility to me? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and yeah, that's it. So a couple of very so, deep, thought-provoking questions. Very, much, very beautiful things. First of all, you know, to say that really opening rooms takes courage. But you also need support because there are rooms you open and if you don't have support, you can't manage them. So we, we are not asking you to open this room so that we find you singing in the streets. Be strategic about how you open these rooms. It might be that you, know, you find a friend with whom you work. It might be that you find, you find counseling. It might be that you know there is some kind of ritual that enhances your well-being so don't just open them randomly and you don't know how to close them where does this get out always think strategically strategic strategic strategy and you know that the responsibility to ourselves is really to sit and have a reflective time mm -hmm. and see where we are where are we what are we sitting on because whatever we are sitting on, we explode. Somehow it will happen, whether we like it or not. You know, and if not, we'll just pass it on to the next generation, the next generation. You don't have to be a parent. Pass it on to the next generation. You can pass it on to the next generation in your workspace. You can do it as an auntie, you can do it as a sister, you can do it with whoever with, with whoever comes in contact with you. So let's have the courage first to understand the rooms and then see which ones we are ready to open and which ones will take time and which ones will take support. 
I was taking a walk when I started opening the rooms of my young days, staying at my uncle's place where I was abused by my uncle's wife. I started talking, writing, talking, writing, and somehow the writing has made life easier for me. But I know she introduced fear in my life. She introduced self neglect She introduced many things, and I have had to deal with those traumas. At one time, I even actually got cancer in. You know, feminism is about the self also being political, and I'm not going to talk without putting myself here and sharing my own experience, and then expecting you to share your own experience. Yeah. So that's why I keep sharing my experience because we are in this together. I'm not the Noah and you are not the, the non Noah. We are all learning together. This is a learning space. So having said that, that then, you know, uh, think about the rooms of yourself and organization as you drew them. Which ones are you comfortable visiting and then spend most of your time in? We tend to find rooms that we are comfortable in and we sit in them over and over again. You are talking to a person, you are trying to talk about rooms, be it at work or home that are not open, but they continue gravitating to what is comfortable. Yes. And that happens too, in terms of the work we do. It happens in the position we occupy in the world. It happens with who we are, that we tend to gravitate towards those rooms we are comfortable in. We fear challenging ourselves. We fear venturing. We fear moving towards the unknown. And we stay in one room. What happens to the other rooms? And which are those rooms you visit occasionally, especially when forced or when persuaded? Like now, after this talk, some people might visit some rooms but tomorrow they will not go back. Or even at work, when we talk about challenging ourselves, we talk about you know, uh, shifting the status quo, we talk about decolonizing, even decolonizing well-being. We shift, but after two days, we find ourselves going back to the norm. One lesson that I learned during COVID is that we don't need a lot of money to take care of ourselves. I don't know how it was for you, uh, Sirika in India, but in Africa, or, or people who come from other parts of the world. But in Africa, and the Africans who are here will you know, testify, we shared information about food, mm. nutritious food. We shared information about herbs, herbs that heal. We shared information about exercises. We shared so much information without paying anything. Yes. We didn't have to go to a spa. And I was asking myself, where was this information? Information that under normal circumstances we, we disregarded. Knowledge that we didn't think is very critical to our well-being. Where we'd rush to doctors, we rushed to ourselves. And there was so much information sharing that was indigenous. There was a lot about circles of healing. There was a lot about families getting together, but I was overwhelmed by the knowledge that is in the community about food and about herbs that heal. It was like Ayurveda was born. Yes, <laughs> we created yes. our own Ayurveda. <laughs> uh, Ayurveda is normally found in India, but in Africa, we created our own Ayurveda. We don't yes. call it Ayurveda but there was really traditional knowledge, traditional knowing, and we respected each other's ways of knowing. It was our knowledge. It was no longer the knowledge of doctors, the knowledge of this and that. It was our knowledge. Yes, we went to doctors, but we also shared a lot. And without that knowledge, COVID would have finished us. That's very true. That's very true. It was, I, I think I can really correlate to that. So, so not coming from a patriarchal pain, colonial angle and, and, you know, yet sharing very little herbs. I remember this concoction that I used to make all through COVID mm. so that it didn't go beyond here. 
and you know africa has amazing herbs you know it's one of it's a cradle of human civilization so mm. so you know i'm i'm sure you had some of the best healing methods that you must But do that you know forgotten. we seem to have forgotten those things you know we really decolonized healing but we are not talking about it i don't know what happened but definitely you know healing doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't have to come from very far if you dig deep you find it in your community yes mm. even creating circles of healing it's not very difficult but as soon as things change we tend to go back to what we were before but there was almost no connection between us and nature we were connected to nature you woke up and the birds and the, the trees everything came healing and we walked and walked and walked and walked because there was no transport even the legs we didn't know had strength found their strength so we 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 need to really sit and revisit what can i do within my own space where do i need others where do i need professional support So these rooms that we might visit occasionally especially when forced might prove to be very important. Let's not go in and get out. And then which rooms do you never visit at all? As I said earlier on you might even have thrown away the keys. Mm. Because they are scary. Mm. Because they 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 traumatized you. because you fear losing your job because you fear losing your partner because you fear losing your respect but what is that doing to the body everything that has ever happened to us is written on the body the body doesn't forget we might forget but the body doesn't forget yes. so when we throw away these keys the body hasn't thrown away the keys and then i think we should think deeper about rooms that remain locked and the reasons for not visiting them those rooms that remain locked and we fear visiting them why is it power is it fear of violence what is it when i say you know uh, when i think about these rooms i wish i knew this when i was 18 there there are things that are have confronted people who have confronted situations that are have been really 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 you know uh faced if i was if i had known this when i was 18 i just started thinking about rooms about 2 years ago and that for me was caused by covid and because covid made me think i sat back and i looked at my life and i was able to think about what i went through as a child and what i went through as a young woman the boys the men you know university you know sexual abuse sexual abuse it, the, the, whether one was raped or not doesn't matter but there is always sexual abuse whether it is someone that is harassing you following you you know on the street that is still you know sexual harassment and abuse and then which rooms do you wish had you had added to your organizational house or your personal house and here you know like organizational house <clears throat> i mean like having a well being session recently i visited an, no last week i visited an organization and has got a happiness manager and the happiness manager checks on everyone ensures there is rest ensures there is food ensures things happen so maybe you are in an organization where you wish there was a happiness manager would you like to go back to your strategic plan and see how this can be done or to go back to your organization and see if you can start talking about these hidden rooms that no one talks about the undiscussables do you have the courage to face your family and say let's sit together because there are many things that are not discussed 
So think deeply about rooms that are locked and the reasons why they are locked. So let me summarize. So as we walk this planet Earth, we have to be aware of what patriarchy, capitalism, colonial, colonialism have done to us. And some of the things we believe that have really that are destroying us every day. And much as we talk about our own liberation, but we live in cages. Yes, we have liberated ourselves here and there. We can't deny that because really in some ways we have liberated ourselves. But how come that there are rooms that we feared opening? How do we connect our well-being with patriarchy? And how do we plan to get out of here? How do we, when we sit and think about organizations and think about ourselves, which are those rooms that are really tight, 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 locked, but as they are locked, they also lock us inside. That we are never free, we are never liberated the way we should. How do we understand exercising our own power within? If I'm talking to others about well-being, how about mine? How do we strengthen our inner so that it can also strengthen the outer? How do we understand well-being? Is it just a footnote? No, it's not. It's the real work that we do because we are working for the happiness of other people. How about us? So I want to challenge us as we go back, think deeply about rooms that remain locked and the reasons for not visiting them. And as we think deeply, take the courage to get a notebook, think about our houses and think about those rooms that no one knows even exists. You don't have to let people know. You don't have to shout loud. It's work in a work. You started working on it. You start working on it, knowing that most of us are working on those rooms. You are not the only one. So with that, um, I want to leave these four minutes to uh, Salika and end my conversation here. Yeah, very excited, very happy to be with you. And let you know that I'm here, I'm available. <laughs> and any time you want to reach out, please do. Thanks so much, Sarika, for giving me this opportunity. I take oh, it humbly my. with gratitude. Thank you. Namaste. My gosh, I, I can't tell you how, uh, I, I feel very strongly here. And uh, I'm so mm. glad that we spent the last one and a half hour talking what we did. It wasn't an easy thing. And I think I, I keep going back to myself. There are many rooms that are locked. But, you know, at least I will, I'm, I'm gathering myself and gathering the courage to face it. And mm. let's see how it goes. But, you know, the the message that I am, I'm taking from here is, uh, is, is that the idea that we must recognize that others can both enhance and diminish the ability to, to, of our well-being and recognize them both separately. And why is it that movements are important? Why is it that people like you are important, right? Why is it that we transcend that border that I relate to you like you're my own sister, right? Mm. So, so I think that that well-being is something that we are talking about here. And, uh, you know, how uh, I just want to quickly go. I have a lot that I want to say, but I want to quickly go through because there are 14 comments here. And uh, Vivian says, whatever we keep in our rooms eventually will surface and will affect our well-being. I agree with you, Hope. Visi is all happy and claps. Malin says, thanks, Hope. Your smile and inner strength brings a smile and hope to make the world better for everyone to get respect. There is a, a tau, I, I can't read her name, but I have to leave a little early. Okay, she's from Quebec. The truth sets us free is the foundation towards true happiness, Malin says. There's Sarita Shreshta who just welcomes people. There is Salome who thanks you. There is Linda who thanks you. There's Courtney who thanks you. There is Aniki who thanks you. There is Chengor, Shara, and Oiba Thulisile. Lots of people, Deborah, Christy, Missy, and everyone says that it's been an amazing Monday. 
and uh, the messages are just dropping in. So I'm, I'm not going to read it anymore, but we just want to reiterate to everyone here that we are all here for each other. So our feminist well-being is not a, a once in a blue moon journey. Feel mm. free to reach out to any of us. And, uh, you know, we, we're all here, we're all available, and we're all a part of the movement building. And uh, I, I totally love you, Hope. I hope that, that you know, we, we do this more often. And, and we'll come back. We promise we'll come back. Stay tuned for first May when you have Nancy Forrestal and Abha Bhaiya talking about feminism from two very different perspectives of one a global north and one from a global south. So thank you everyone and sending you all lots of healing and lots of love and, and thank you Hope. See you soon. Bye everyone. Bye.